Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 101st episode of Don't Forget the Popcorn. Thank you to everyone who watched my 100th episode, my 100 favorite movies. I'll link that below if you're interested. But it is October, my favorite month of the year, my birthday, the weather change, and of course, spooky movie time. Shout out to my man Marlon Bellamy for requesting this one a while back. I told you I'd do it, bro, in October. And today, I'm going to be reviewing one of my favorite horror movies from the 90s, Tales from the Hood, 1995, directed by Rusty Cundeef. This month, guys, all the reviews and videos will be spooky related, so just be ready for that. Now, Tales from the Hood is one of those movies that screams 90s black cinema, from the music, the way they're dressed, and the subject matter. Lots of early 90s black movies dealt with problems in the black community, showing a lot of the world what was going on in some of these communities. This movie has that narrative but neatly packaged in a collection of short stories that I think shows a lot of major things going on in these communities at the time. Drugs, gangs, murder, police brutality, parental issues, you name it. But this movie somehow turns these heavy subjects into horror magic. That puts us in these situations and makes us feel the intensities of some of the lifestyles. It literally shows us the horrors of it, and I think it was trying to teach us all a lesson. I'll just say this now. In my opinion, I do not think this movie is glorifying any kind of gang violence, drug dealing or using, black-on-black crime, or police brutality. I think it's actually serving as a message to the community to show you how horrifying it actually is. Now, let me not act like I'm some kind of philosopher because I am not, but it is clear what this movie is set out to do outside of entertaining us. Now, Clarence Williams III, rest in peace, was brilliant in his performance. He plays the mortician who is telling us the stories here. So this movie is about three young drug dealers who go visit a mortician who has some shit for them. While there, he begins showing them some of the corpses and telling them the stories of how they got there. Most of them are black males. All of these stories have some real life moral implications to them or tie into things that we were really happening. Things that the community suffer from, like racism and police brutality, or the evils that come from the community, like drug dealing and murder. The film doesn't try and victimize its characters. It shows the truth and the results of one's actions, and I think that's the realest aspect of this movie. All the stories are heightened scenarios that can have happened all throughout the community. Now, I'm not going to go through each story and break them down bit by bit, but I'll reference all of them at one point or another as I go over the themes and tell you my favorite one. I love the vibe of this movie. It's pretty much dark most of the time in this movie. It's just got that dusty 90s vibe to it that I love so much. Is this movie scary? Actually, I would say it is. When I was a kid, this movie scared me a lot. It's got some really nice practical 90s effects, and I think they still hold up pretty good. The writing is pretty slick, and the editing is smooth. It's hard for some of these lower-budget horror movies from back in the day to still make an impact, and this one still does. Honestly, this movie may be more effective now. I think everyone should be watching this this Halloween season. It's a little crazy how relevant this movie still is in so many ways. All right, so let's get to it. The mortician has these boys here, and they just want to get in and out, and he's not having that. He must talk to them, show them around the funeral home, and tell them these tales of horror. Now, the thing is, these boys are criminals. These aren't stories that they haven't heard before or even experienced themselves. But things are different when the body is right in front of you, and some creepy old dude is telling you how it got there. The first story just shows us why body cams were needed. It's a story about a black cop who feels guilt for not stepping up when its partner was out of line. Now, this story here is to lure men a bit. They know about police brutality. They don't need this guy to tell them. But it's always great to see revenge. Like a dirty cop getting dirty drug needles shot into his body as he's nailed to the wall like Jesus. Police brutality obviously isn't exclusive to black people. Cops all over have done wrong to people of all types, but I think we know it was a little while back in the 90s in the black community. I think I can say this since this movie's released in 95, it has gotten better with blacks and cops. Well, yes and no. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Now, these dudes think this guy is nuts. And I mean, rightfully so. But the story is entertaining and kind of cool. Now, the next story, I'll be honest, in my own opinion, is the weakest. And not because it wasn't good or meaningful. I just think it was the weakest execution of the four. Now, I agree. Domestic violence was an issue in the community. 
I just kind of hate how they went about it with the whole drawing thing. I think David Allen Greer played the role of the monster very well, though. Just a little corny on the execution. And I mean, let's keep it real. There was no real lesson learned here. This was a lucky situation where the mom probably would have died had the light-skinned dude just not happened to be outside. Because she wasn't going to leave him. Good theme, bad representation. Now, that's just my opinion. The way they show the racism in this movie is pretty great. The movie displays it correctly. It's not overtly racist or in your face. It's laced into the fabric. Through the actions of the police and the po politicians, particularly to this time period, you have the former Klansman who is running for senator living in the old haunted plantation house. He's got a light-skinned campaign manager helping him clean up his image and appear as a changed man. Of course, only to get votes. This man's ignorance is his downfall. Now this story I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail. Not because of its themes of racism, which are obviously there, but because it's fucking scary as shit and scared me as a kid. So this senator set up his house and office on this old southern haunted plantation home and protesters have been there telling him to leave, he doesn't belong there, etc. Now, he's like, I don't care, screw all of you. In this house, there is a painting of an older black woman in a rocking chair, surrounded by little black children. In her lap is this little black boy. This little boy is an actual doll that is still in the house. This doll kind of lurks around and appears places randomly. It's beyond creepy. He's got it out for this white dude, and when the time comes, all the freaking kids come to life off the painting in the form of dolls and kill this dude. It's scary, and honestly, just batshit crazy. It's my favorite story of them all. Now, yes, racism is terrible, and I think it's only fair to say everyday race relations are much better than they were in 95, but still not perfect. I think this film does a good job of not victimizing anyone. It shows that there are two sides to every coin. That yes, you must fight the powers that are keeping you down, but a lot of self-improvement must be done too. One thing about the black community is that the late 80s and early 90s really shaped the perception of what it is today. In the 80s, you had crack come in, one of the worst things to hit the world, truthfully. It destroyed lives and communities. Along with the drug came HIV. Now, there are tons of theories and conspiracies on how this all happened. But with drugs come money and violence. Tons of young black males killing each other over drugs and money. One of the main problems people seem to have with the black community. Drugs change things. You saw thriving neighborhoods turn to post-apocalyptic looking wastelands. It's a sad part of the American fabric. I think the movie shows this perfectly. And I think this movie has a brilliant ending and final story. We get a story about a dude named Crazy K. Who's a psycho killer dude. He's killed many young black men. And is quite proud of it. And sure of himself. And his lifestyle. Crazy K gets into an altercation with some guys because he killed one of their friends. So, of course, they go for him in retaliation. Crazy K, laying on the ground, wounded, starts to have a vision or a dream. He goes into a Kubrickian-like dream where he is in a weird jail and they show him things and run tests on him. Just think of a clockwork orange. He is confronted with all of the lives he has taken, all of the innocent bystanders he killed along the way, like little kids and young teens who were just in the crosshairs. I think this is where the movie really does its work. When this comes out, this was the lifestyle a lot of young men were living. This is why we had all these hood classics come out at the time. Menace to Society, Boys in the Hood, New Jack City, Fresh, you name it. Drugs and gun violence was a huge issue, and honestly, still is. I believe the filmmaker wanted to put a mirror up to the people and make them think, and maybe want to change things in the community. Because no matter what group it is, in order to make positive change, people must unite first and then fight your battles together. It's hard to win a war when the soldiers are out taking each other out well crazy k wakes up and he isn't in good shape the three guys who caught him are standing over him and who is it are three guys who have been listening to the stories from the old man they shoot this dude a whole bunch of times the boys get pissed as the old man is telling the story and threaten him and push him around but he's ultimately led them to the basement of the mortuary they do not like what he is saying, and they think he's going to bust them for the murder. But they couldn't be more wrong. There are three more coffins down in the basement. 
He has them open them, and it's the three of them in there. They freak out, and the old man reveals that the cycle continued. Crazy K's homies came through and smoked them for killing Crazy K. And oh yes, the old man is the devil. And these three dudes are going to burn in hell forever. It's actually quite a scary and effective scene. When I was a kid, I was like, I'm never going to kill anyone. This is insane. This hood horror classic did its job on me as a kid. I'll tell you what. This world we live in is a weird one. One that really doesn't make any sense. I think this movie shows that, but also shows us that the normalcy is possible all through this horrific lens. Now, I know I painted this movie like some hood political message, but it isn't. It's fun, got some great practical horror, and is one that should be watched every October. The lessons in this movie are real, though, and I think this is a brilliant way to use a fun medium to spread a message. Nothing is too in your face. It's all an organic thing, and the scenarios and situations will make your mind wander on its own. I absolutely love this movie, and I think it's one everyone should watch at least once. It's a staple in black cinema and a horror classic. I'm going to give Tales from the Hood an 8 out of 10. Guys, thank you so much for watching my Tales from the Hood review. Let me know if there's a film or topic you'd like me to go over. Guys, like and subscribe if you made it to the end. It really helps me out. Follow me on Letterboxd, Ralph Vader. I'll link that below. I got a podcast with my buddy, The Cutting Room Floor. I'll link that below for more movie content. I will be back next week. And don't forget the popcorn.